People talk about moments in time. Well, I met someone quite by chance a few weeks ago and I've read his book, Moments in Time. Not many know him, but he is an amazing human being who at the age of 73 still works in the NHS as a child specialist. Over the last 25 years, he has helped millions around the world with medical and humanitarian projects, which largely empower women. I am delighted to introduce you to someone who holds an OBE and is Deputy Lieutenant to Her Majesty the Queen. What is more is that when presenting him with the freedom of Warsaw, the Mayor said he has achieved what most of us would take two lifetimes to do. Welcome Professor Gatrad. Thank you very much for inviting me. So you were born in Malawi, Yes. educated in Rhodesia True. and you got your medical degree in the UK Yes, that's right. alongside being a postman. Yes, that came along the way too, yeah. Will you please share with us your journey? Okay, well, my dad wanted me to be a doctor at the age of five. So I went to sec uh, primary school and finished my primary education, still wanting to be a doctor. So they used to call me Dr. G when I was even <laughs> at primary school. Anyway, eventually I passed the exams to go to Zimbabwe because there was no secondary education. Zimbabwe used to be called Rhodesia then. Uh, so I went there, got through all the O-levels and A-levels, and then came to England and went to Harrow College. That's where problems started in terms of finance, because my dad, although he could afford to send me to England and the education, the government stopped all monies coming for my education. So I had to work as a postman just before I went to university and qualified at, at, at the University of Leeds. And were there any difficulties that you encountered after qualifying? Yes, after qualifying, I think the difficulties are always for any junior doctor, and that is getting one job after another and moving places, like I went from Leeds to Rotherham to Doncaster. But I think the biggest problem I really had was soon after I actually got all my qualifications. And how did you overcome this? Well, I think I just had to get more and more degrees and get more and more uh, experience in order to get to the top. And I note from your book that you've got eight degrees, actually. Is that a record? Uh, well, yes, I've got eight degrees. <laughs> not a record. I'm sure there are a few people who have got more degrees than I have, but not that many, I would guess. In spite of being employed full time until more recently, you've dedicated a lot of your life to people in need around the world. How did this come about? Tell us about that. Um, very difficult to get jobs in 1982, this is, uh, largely due to, I think, discrimination. So I had to work three or four extra years to get to being a consultant. And the story really is that I was going for this umpteenth interview to for the job in Walsall and I was going to Birmingham and I was going down the M6 it was just being built at the time and my wife was with me we started off in reasonable time three four hours to get to Manchester wasn't a problem but we got stuck on the motorway and the traffic was such that we just couldn't move and I asked my wife I said could you go out and ring the Queen Elizabeth because in those days we didn't have any uh, mobile phones and she wasn't having anything of this because traffic was moving slowly and she said I'll be running after the car and I won't be able to catch you so I'm not getting out of the car anyway at that point I was really desperate so I looked upstairs and I said oh god get me out of this mess you get me out of this mess and give me a good job I'm going to do something big for you and that's where my life changed that's really incredible so what's the first thing you did well for the first few months I just didn't know what to do and I was a bit like a fish out of water because I had to keep my promise to the Almighty, you know. So uh, I met this chap one day and he said that lots of children in Walsall were running around and really not being focused on anything. So I knew what I had to do, build a mosque and a community centre. This took 10 years to do. I was the project manager, but I completed it in 1994. Wow. So, Professor Gadra, tell me what happened next. Well, I actually met this incredible man. Uh, I was in my office. I was head of department at the time. He knocked at the door and he said, can I come and talk to you for a few minutes? I knew this gentleman because he's well known in the community. 
and he wanted to get some braille machines for Bosnia and this is 1992. So I sat him down and it was at this point in time that our friendship grew in strength and he's here 25 years later and we worked together and done loads of things around the world. So I actually spoke to Mr Aslam earlier today. Welcome Mr Aslam, it's great to have you here with me today. Thank you. You have worked with Professor Gatrad for over 25 years now. Yeah. What is one single vision that he has had that's had maximum impact? Uh, his ambition is woman in power. That's the man his ambition is at the moment, which he's working for. Yes, he joined with me 25 years ago. I'm founder yeah. member of the charities called Midland International Aid Trust UK. And so far, I travel about 78 times in 26 countries, all over the world. Wow, that's impressive. Wherever disaster occurred, whether it's uh, uh, flooding, whether it's war or uh, earthquake, you know, you name it, any country, I've been there. And I spent three and a half years abroad uh, with support of my family, particular, and also the people who actually donated the money for the last 20 or oh, nearly 30 years. I'd like to thank everyone. And Professor Gatrat, since we met 25 years ago, we're doing so many medical camps. I think with thousands and thousands of people benefited with the cataract operation in four or five different countries. And also is set up maternity unit in Gujarat hospital we build and also the uh, the consultants doctors go from UK Ireland Qatar and uh, um, the uh, Dubai and they go every six months and I travel every six months uh, do the cataract operation and cleft and palate and um, cleft feet uh, and also the hearing aid to the children who are born with deafness. And also I'd like to thank my own family who has been supporting me for so long. Without the support of my wife and my children, there was no, not possible. Thank you so much for joining me here today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, Professor Gatrad, can you give me some examples of what Mr. Aslam was saying earlier today about empowering women? Well, where do I start? That's the first thing. Because over the last 25 years, we've concentrated on making sure that young girls and young women yeah, are educated and also have a life. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, we started off with cleft operations, which ensures that the child looks better a cleft child with an odd sort of face, odd mouth, can't feed, is actually a burden to the family. So we ensured that we started operating on all the girls first. Okay? So when you, do, when you have a cleft problem, you can't hear, you can't speak properly, you can't go to school, you can't get married. All these things with any disability that you have in developing countries creates a problem. Because these are big families, they've got five, six, seven children. And they have to feed, parents have to feed these children. And this child is difficult to feed anyway, but he's not going to bring any money in. So what happens is that these children then are left on the streets. And what happens is they go to prostitution and they're trafficked. So in order to do all that, we've got all these projects, one of which is clefts. Secondly, we actually do club feet because children who can't walk, particularly girls, they're, sit, they're walking on crutches and they, you can see them on the streets. I've seen them in Malawi, Africa, Gambia. So it's a simple thing to do. If you actually catch these little girls earlier after birth, and boys, of course, as well, uh, we can straighten their feet with special braces and they get better. So that's the second project. The third project is audiology. A lot of children, there's a much higher incidence of babies born deaf, particularly because of intermarriage, so we've got these girls that are checked, and indeed boys as well, that are checked at birth, and their education is improved so they can talk. So lots of these projects that we have got are actually helping children. Once they're older, we've got things like, for example, um, vocational training for them, sewing classes, dressmaking classes, and all these things go on. Schooling is probably the most important thing. 
because there's a saying which says, uh, if you educate a woman, you educate a nation. This is what we're trying to do, okay? So these girls, we give them schools in Gambia, Kashmir, lots of countries. We also provide them, interestingly, with toilets. We've been to schools of girls where there are no toilets. Girls don't go to school. Wow. Girls don't go to school if they are having a period. So what we are doing is we are using uh, the same girls that are sewing, remember, yeah. with vocational training. They sew, for these girls, sanitary pads that are reusable. That's incredible. So they can get to school. So it's all about empowering women. And there are also some older women we look after. For example, we've got a huge clinic uh, in a place called Suklan, which is outside Gujarat, where we have got um, uh, young ladies who are pregnant. So we look after them with giving them antibiotics, giving them uh, vitamins. And we also look after the elderly, because the elderly have almost always got either worms or they've got vitamin D deficiency. So what we try and do is do something simple that has got a huge impact, not only on the health, but also the lives of the families. I can definitely see why you chose Empowering Women, Professor Gatrad. Is there anything that you have done locally that you can be proud of and you are recognised for? Uh, yes, I think one of the biggest things I suppose I've done locally has been when I first came to Walsall, one of my jobs was actually to decrease the death rate of newborn babies and there were 19 per thousand dying. And in five or six years, it wasn't only me, it's the team that I built around me. <coughs> so we all together were able within five years to halve the death rate of babies. So instead of 19 dying per thousand after birth, we brought it down to about nine per thousand dying. And it was as a result of that that also recognized me with the freedom of the borough also. That's remarkable. And being Deputy Lieutenant to Her Majesty the Queen, that yeah. must mean that you rub shoulders with royalty. It actually doesn't. You actually don't meet them very much, although I've met the Queen a couple of times. But uh, one of the, I suppose, jobs of a Deputy Lieutenant is to take the royals around when they are in your region. So I've been, for example, with uh, Princess Royal. I have spent a whole afternoon with Princess Agnes. I've been with Princess Alexandra, I've been with the Duke of, uh, Duke of Kent. So we've had some lovely time. And they are human beings just as much as you are. But it's such an honor to be able to do something like that. And when I got this letter, which says, would I like to be a Deputy Lieutenant of the Queen? I bet you were made up. Are you going to say no? <laughs> <laughs> no? So all of this, you can't have a lot of time for hobbies and things that you love to do. Well, I used to play a lot of cricket and a lot of tennis. Actually, I played cricket for what used to be Rhodesia. So I played at quite a high level. And even when I came to university, I played a lot of cricket. In my latter years, I actually used to be a coach to the King Edward School in, uh, in, in Birmingham. So yes, I've enjoyed cricket, I've enjoyed tennis. But time comes when your back's not doing very well. So there are other things that I do now that I still enjoy. So Professor Gatrad, what is next? Well, there's lots to do still. Well, I hope I have enough life to be able to complete what I'm doing. I still continue to work in Malawi and all these other places that I mentioned to you. Uh, we still continue to do club feet for children, look after clefts. But because I fell down in Malawi about two years ago, whilst I was doing my humanitarian work and broke my leg, uh, whilst I was looking at a girl that was blind, in fact, or thought to be blind, so whilst I was looking at her eyes, I thought, well, she, can, she should be able to see, really. So I got her operated on, uh, and she can see now. But whilst I was running around trying to get transport for her to go from the village to the clinic where I was actually having cataract operations, I actually fell down and broke my leg. So when I broke my leg, I continued walking on it, which was stupid. And when I came back here, I got seriously told off by my colleagues. I can imagine. <laughs> I, was actually, I was actually off work for five months. Wow. And after the operation, I developed sepsis. So whilst I was in bed, I was thinking, well, I don't know whether I'm ever going to walk again. So then I really got this idea. I don't know where it came from, but I thought, I think I should do something about plastics. So I'm now the founder of Walsall Against Single-Use Plastic. Walsall Against Single-Use Plastic, which is WhatsApp. 
But that, Jodie, is a big, long story. And can I just ask, how do you get the money for all these projects? How do you bring these projects to life? Well, I think the most important thing is I've been so fortunate that I've got a huge network of people. Before I used to go and beg. Now, a lot of people actually give me monies for my projects. But f I've been fortunate enough to be comfortable myself, so a lot of my salary also goes into these projects. So You're whenever amazing. I do something, I just do it where I know there is enough money to sort their project out. That's really amazing. And if anybody wanted to get involved in this charity, how could they get involved in it? Well, they could look at our website, yeah. which is www.myatwalsall.org.uk. So that's really the main charity that you can uh, get involved with by, by, by finding out what it's all about. Or you can write to me on info at myatwalsall.org.uk. Professor Gatrad, it has been an absolute pleasure having you here in the studio with me today. Well, thank you for having me, Jodie. It just goes to show how simple things can have such a huge impact globally. I'm Jodie Duckworth and thank you for watching Miss England TV.